Hi folks and welcome back to Conveyancing. This is video two in the video series on seller disclosure. And if you'll recall back to video one, we had a little look at disclosure obligations at law. We looked at defects in title and we looked at defects in quality of title. So tick, we've gotten one of the limbs of this module uh, done now and now we head into the seller's disclosure obligations under statute. And, <laughs> oh dear, we've got to look at this with some element of humour, folks. Um, I like the little man jumping up with the, the seat that's just given him a shock. Um, there is an expanding cornucopia of uh, disclosure legislation and you've got to just look at this and smile. There is some of the cast of thousands there listed for you. And as I say, probably a good idea to get a handy list together if you can save you uh, having to have nightmares about all the fine detail <laughs> under all of the different pieces of legislation. Um, again, this is, uh, it looks very complex and it is, um, although to some extent, some of these obligations have been taken care of by the um, REIQ contracts. So again, uh, not that it's eliminated any of this stuff, but it has ushered some of these requirements into the REIQ standard terms themselves. So it makes it easier to tick these things off the list. Okay, so uh, what I'll do, I'll cover them in a slightly different order uh, than that of the text, because if you scan down, you'll see Land Sales Act, uh, and then you scan down a little bit further and you'll see the Body Corporate and Community Management Act. The, um, the disclosure regimes for proposed lots under the Land Sales Act and under the BCCMA are very, very similar. And so I want to deal with those two together because you can kind of, they're almost you know, mirror, um, mirror objects of each other. So uh, I'll, I'll do the, the first few and then I'll, I'll cover the Land Sales Act and we'll probably stop there. Uh, and then we'll go forward with the BCCMA after that. Now before we get into the nuts and bolts of the different pieces of legislation, um, in case you think I'm hamming this up, which you know I'm not, well I kind of am, but I'm not, um, the issue of seller disclosure in Queensland under all these different pieces of legislation has been a source of fairly major concern for quite some time now. Um, and, you know, if you think it's confusing to the likes of you and I that are lawyers, um, you know, you can imagine what it would be like for a poor buyer trying to enter into a, a transaction in a non-REIQ uh, contract. Um, and so there was a report done in 2017. The final report came out at the end of 2017. was done by, uh, in fact, QUT and some of the authors of our text um, and their recommendations were obviously to streamline this whole area of disclosure significantly. I put the link up there for you in case you're interested in going and having a, a little look at it. Um, at the first stage of recommendations they said uh, you know you should just round everything up and whack it into one consolidated piece of legislation. All of the various different elements of disclosure on the various different facets, you know, smoke alarms and, you know, um, pool and everything, you should just pop that into one statute applying to land, uh, simplify the form of disclosure through a seller statement and we'll be looking at disclosure statements in under a couple of different pieces of legislation. Uh, so they said use a seller statement, um, require all of this disclosure to happen really early on so you don't have all these unfortunate buyers in these unfortunate situations where they've locked themselves into contract and then all of a sudden you know there's been a problem with disclosure before they've signed on the dotted line and now they can't get out of the, the contract. Uh, and limiting disclosure obligations to those that are reasonable, ready, readily accessible and so forth, you know, not too expensive. Um, as I said, the link's there if you want to go and have a look. Um, so this is a fairly significantly um, complex area 
and uh, we'll just go through the major pieces of legislation that are covered in the text. Um, that's not it by, by any means um, and if some of you end up in conveyancing practice I'm sure that you will uh, become intimately familiar with uh, a wealth of legislation that will come across your desk that may have some bearing on um, disclosure obligations but these are the, the you know the basics that you need to know in terms of uh, the text and this unit. Okay so the first one is the QBCCA and that relates to building work. Uh, yes you can't be a slap happy home renovator and uh, knock down half your house, rebuild it in a shoddy fashion uh, and get away with that scot free unfortunately. Um, Section 47 says that if building works carried out on land and that land is sold within six years after the works completed, then before before that seller enters a contract of sale with a purchaser, they have to give that purchaser notice of the building work, what was done, and the prescribed warning. So when you're looking at this, I guess you're thinking, what is building work? Well, it's not really defined, but handily in the regulations, uh, you do see what building work is not. And building work is not such things as uh, work that's of a value of $3,300, not the specific number there, but $3,300 or less, uh, subject to a few exceptions there, things like uh, farming fences and so forth. So have a little look. Uh, Schedule 1 of the QBCC regulations is where you go to have a look at that. Uh, so that's your building work. Your time limit is six years. Uh, when you sell, you have to tell them what you did and give them this warning. Now this is designed as a big red, you know, good old Lord Dennings red hand. Um, the building work's not going to be covered by statutory insurance and uh, that's, that's the big red flag there. Um, if the seller does not comply with this obligation to disclose, can the uh, purchaser back out once they find out that it's been done by uh, a, a home renovator, an un unlicensed person? Uh, no, they can't. The seller is deemed to have given a contractual warranty that the work was properly carried out, but at the end of the day, that really just leaves the buyer with an action for damages. So that's all you've got there. So the seller is meant to do the right thing. They are meant to serve, serve the notice as prescribed. But at the end of the day, uh, their biggest exposure will be possibly having to foot the bill if uh, the purchaser finds that the works need were defective and needed to be corrected. Okay, so that's the QBCCA. The EPA deals with contamination and this is one of those issues that as a buyer you certainly uh, want to have properly squared away. Um, under section 408, if the land is either on the contaminated land register, actually entered on the register, or it is subject to various notices, and one of those kinds of notices is a show cause notice. The seller may uh, have land that has been affected by contaminants and uh, the EPA can actually give you a notice to say, yeah, we think your land's contaminated. Can you show us a, a reason, show cause, why it shouldn't be placed on the contaminated land register? Uh, so if, if the land is either on the register already or is subject to one of these various different kinds of notices, then before, before agreeing to dispose of the land, the seller has to give the notice stating the various uh, particulars set out there in 408. There's no prescribed form of notice, uh, but if you do not comply as seller, then the buyer can rescind before either uh, possession or completion. Okay. Uh, there was a case not too long ago, Albion Mill, um, and that dealt with the kind of slight uncertainty there, the fact that there was no prescribed form of notice. And um, there was the sale and purchase of a development site at Albion. Um, there was no formal notice of, um, you know, the land being affected under the EPA, under Section 4, 408 provided. However, um, the seller and the buyer were negotiating in um, this data room. 
they were swapping documents in a data room. And in that data room, the seller had placed relevant information about the land and its contaminants issue. Uh, luckily for the seller, there was an email from the buyer indicating that they were aware of the contamination issue and they were going to get more advice on it. Uh, so they could establish that the buyer had been made aware of the issue. In that particular case, it was held that there was sufficient information given over in that, that data room uh, for the purposes of the EPA to be um, satisfied. However, obviously, uh, you know, if you're going to be selling land of a reasonable value, and these things often are, uh, that one was for development, so, you know, these things are often multi-million dollar deals, you want to make very, very sure as seller that you are serving the appropriate notices here. You certainly don't want the buyer backing out uh, somewhere close to completion. Note, however, if your seller client comes to you and says, oh, I've contracted to sell this um, development site and I haven't given the appropriate uh, notices in relation to the contaminated land register, there is the ability to fix up that problem uh, post hoc if you will, uh, under 408.5 um, you can try and rectify that problem after contract but before settlement. However, if you do it that way then the buyer can rescind within 21 days otherwise they're deemed to have waived their ability to do so. So that is the EPA and contamination. So in terms of the electrical safety switches regime and the next one which is the smoke alarms regime, you'll notice that they're quite similar to each other so I'll kind of deal with them one after the other. Um, the electrical safety regulation of 2013 says that all of your domestic residences have to be fitted with these uh, safety switches for your um, electrical outlets very eminently sensible. Um, Regulation 82 deals with the disclosure requirement there. Notice has to be provided by a transfer or to a transferee of a domestic residence uh, as to whether the switch has been installed. That notice, there you go, it has to be provided before possession. Before possession. So you can actually include the relevant notification in your contract and in fact that is what has been done in the REIQ standard contract so there's a spot there to fill uh, that in in the reference schedule. has to be given to the transferee now note that it can't be given to the transferee's solicitor so this is why it's handy dandy to pop it into the REIQ uh, contract there because it will suffice for that purpose. If you don't comply then it doesn't affect your contract at common law. There's this little fine, 15 penalty units. Now, I don't know if you know how to find out how much a penalty unit is. They should be teaching that you that um, kind of stuff in um, statutory interpretation, or at least I'm hoping you should have come into contact with that issue um, in CRIM. Um, but a penalty unit is um, a unit of money that's prescribed under the Acts Interpretation Act and then the Acts Interpretation Act sends you off to the penalties and uh, penalty units, uh, some kind of other subordinate legislation and um, it's set there, it's updated every year and it's currently $133.45. So 15 of those makes this fine um, around $2,000 there. So yeah, it's a fair whack if you don't actually say the right thing in your REIQ contract in terms of your safety switch on the property. Um, it's unlikely to be a warranty so therefore it's not going to allow a buyer to terminate if you haven't uh, given the correct notification here. However, if a buyer takes the property and there has been no safety switch installed, then they're going to have to put one in. So that's Regulation 84 there. Um, with this regime and the next one as well, um, notice about the status of the state safety switch on the property has to be also given to the regulator within 90 days. And the way that that's done is that once your um, contract is all complete and you're gearing up for settlement, uh, that will that relevant notification there to the re regulator will be on the form 24 that you uh, lodge for registration. So that's safety switches and you'll see it's very similar to the regime for smoke alarms.
So the Fire and Emergency Services Act is the relevant legislation there. 104RB is the actual obligation to have compliant smoke alarms. And this regulation tends to change and tends to be made more stringent <laughs> over time. Uh, there's just been a recent change uh, in relation to smoke alarms, but that's your basic obligation. You've got to have smoke alarms on your dwelling. Uh, 104RK is the seller's um, disclosure obligation there. The transferor has to give notice to your transferee. Once again, not the transferee's solicitor, notice to the transferee whether compliant alarms have been installed. Again, has to be provided before possession. So you can include this in your contract itself. Um, it doesn't have to be given before the contract has been concluded. Okay, so you can just pop it right into the contract there. REIQ has it in the a spot ready for you in the reference schedule. If not, once again, it doesn't affect your contract. At common law, there might be a little fine if you've done something naughty and said there's been a smoke alarm when in fact there hasn't. Um, Again, the buyer's going to have to put one in if there is not one there and notice has to be given within 90 days to the commissioner. Again, that generally happens via the Form 24. So that's your smoke alarm situation. And then we come to the Land Sales Act. Now when you come to reading about this uh, disclosure regime in the Land Sales Act, in the text, um, it's quite dense and there's a lot of material that kind of hits you in the face and it's kind of hard to see the wood for the trees, if you will. Uh, so what I want to do is just sketch it out for you in its most basic form so that you have a rough understanding of the lie of the land, so ho, no pun intended, um, before you hit the text. Um, and then you can flesh out all of the fine detail uh, for yourself. But in essence, this is what it's all about. The Land Sales Act uh, is specifically is consumer protection legislation that's meant to protect buyers that are proposing to purchase into property development. And particularly what these, this disclosure regime is meant to uh, achieve is that everybody, all the parties to the transaction, but most particularly the buyers, will have access to very, very clear information about the lot that they are proposing to buy, um, the proposed lot, I should say. <clears throat> And it's all about being able to identify and locate these proposed lots to, well, firstly, make sure that everyone's on the same page and secondly, to minimise uh, squabbles about this kind of thing. It applies to proposed lots, that is, lots that will become lots on a registration plan. Um, and these lots are not going to be part of any kind of community titles scheme. So that's why we call them proposed non-CTS lots. Okay, but in the legislation, they're just called a proposed lot. All of the uh, disclosure regimes that deal with proposed lots that will become lots in a community titles scheme are to be dealt with under the um, BCCMA, which we'll talk about in a minute, the B Building Units and Group Titles Act, or the South Bank legislation there. So uh, the Land Sales Act just deals with um, proposed lots relating to non-community titles scheme land. It doesn't apply to a number of different things, including a large transaction that is uh, a transaction where you're selling six or more lots at the same time uh, in one agreement, or you're selling lots via two or more agreements in the same 24 hour period. Um, so, this is, you know, developers that are selling off um, lot by lot rather than in large lumps. Um, Section 10 starts off the disclosure regime there before entering the contract. So straight away you know the seller has to get their game organised before they go about handing out contracts for sale and purchase. Okay, Before entering the contract, the seller is required to supply the buyer with either a disclosure plan and disclosure statement, 
where you haven't yet progressed far enough along the development track to actually have a registered plan. Okay, so you can give your proposed buyers a disclosure plan and disclosure statement or a an approved plan of survey. Okay. So far as option A is concerned, so your disclosure plan plus disclosure statement. The statement has to state, as section 12 says, that the seller has actually given the buyer this disclosure plan, uh, whether the development approval has been granted and significantly that the seller must settle within 18 months, okay, and will give any other documents necessary uh, at least 14 days before settlement. Uh, what they don't want is uh, developers hanging around. You know, sometimes you seem to see development sites with the uh, the development fencing all around them, and they stay there for months and months, years and years. I've got one. Well, there's a few on the Gold Coast here that seem to have been there for years and years. Uh, they want this this stuff done relatively expeditiously. So within 18 months, the seller has to go ahead and actually settle. Now, if the disclosure plan details either are or have become inaccurate in some way, uh, you are not without uh, a plan of action, so to speak, for the seller. Under Section 13, you can vary details that have become inaccurate by means of serving a further disclosure statement on the buyer and uh, setting out uh, more accurately the details that have become inaccurate or were inaccurate in the original documentation. Now at that stage um, if the contract has not settled and the buyer would suffer material prejudice uh, then they can terminate within 21 days. Now the question of what is or isn't a material prejudice uh, was discussed by the court in the Wilson and Mervac Queensland cases. Um, those cases were decided in the context of the BCCMA legislation uh, rather than the Land Sales Act, but they are still considered to be like the leading judgment in relation to what is or isn't material prejudice. And uh, the court in that particular case, the Court of Appeal, uh, said that a person would be materially prejudiced if disadvantaged substantially as to an important extent. Okay. Uh, disadvantage in a way which is substantial or of much consequence. So that's what the court said there in the Wilson case. As I said, even though it was decided under the BCCMA, um, it, it tends to get transported over here to the Land Sales Act. And in fact, the text uh, agrees that you know it it would be um, the the phrase material prejudice would be interpreted consistently. Uh, with the other legislation. So uh, if in fact the seller does have to serve a, uh, a variation of the disclosure plan under section 13 then it will all turn on whether the buyer suffers that material prejudice as to whether or not they can terminate within that relatively short 21 day time frame. There are some further pre-settlement uh, disclosure obligations on the seller. Obviously, if you haven't um, actually obtained an approved survey plan when you uh, are uh, undertaking your initial disclosure with the buyer, um, then you need to provide them with an approved survey plan and also a statement from a surveyor saying that there's no differences between the registered plan and the original disclosure plan that you provided to the buyer at the beginning of the game. Um, if the seller doesn't comply with their requirements under this legislation, then there are a stack of triggers for a buyer to terminate the contract. For example, uh, under 10.3 for failure to comply with those preliminary disclosure requirements. Under 13.4, um, if the there is an inaccuracy in the disclosure plan and you've done your variation but there has been some material prejudice and uh, there's that 21 day period to, to terminate there. Under 13.6, if there has been inaccuracies and they if the seller has not served the buyer with a variation of the disclosure plan under section 13, uh, then again the buyer can terminate and also under 14.5 for failure to settle within that 18 month period or to provide those 
final disclosure documents. So that is a rough outline of the uh, the Land Sales Act regime for disclosure regarding proposed non-community title scheme lots. And that is where we'll leave it for today. Apologies, we went a little over the time. However, I will come back in video three and have a little look at the BCCMA and the last few pieces of legislation as well as the REIQ contracts. So until then, bye for now guys.